You hear a lot of different stories about all these uh, uh, mob families. When you got five different families out there, like New York, you run into problems. You've been a tough guy since you were a kid coming up. When I grew up, my father was a real tough guy. He was a driver, a wheelman, and a killer. And a killer. Of course it bothered me. I think about the faces all the time. How do you process it? Does it happen when you're sleeping? It's done. It... It's over with. There's nothing I could do. I can't. You can't bring him back. He's then clean your dirty laundry. No. I didn't fall out of a tree. I've heard that term used too many times. If you've seen the movie Casino, the guy's head in the vice. Mm -hmm. Don't make me be a bad guy. Come on. I didn't do that. Well, let's say Tony done it. Roll, when you use that word, that's like snitching. Is the same yeah, thing? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay, got it. We got a big robbery. It was a bank. We didn't count the money as we were taking it out. We threw it in duffel bags. I was 18 years old. I've never seen that much money in my life. Then the bad news came. That's when I really learned about the Chicago outfit. And regardless of what you're hearing, this is true story. So today we have another uh, former Mafia member from Chicago that moved to Vegas to work with Tony Spallatra. Frank Collada is his name. And if you don't know who Frank Collada is, Frank Collada, if you've seen the movie Casino, uh, Frank Vincent played the role of Frank Marino, which is really Frank Collada. And he was running with Joe Pesci, who played Nicky Santoro, which in real life, it's really the story of Tony Spallatra. And there's a lot of different things we're going to talk about today. You know, a lot of different stories, a lot of different backgrounds, the difference between the New York outfits versus Chicago and a bunch of other topics. So with that being said, Frank Collada. Frank, thank you so much for being a guest here on Valuetainment. Appreciate you for coming nice. out. Right. Uh, so, so Frank, you know, you, you hear a lot of different stories about all these uh, uh, mob families, New York, Chicago, all these different outfits. What was the biggest different culturally with Chicago mob family versus the ones in New York? You know, I don't know how to answer that question, to be truthful with you. We're a bunch of Italian people, if that's what you're looking for. And uh, we stuck together. We had values, principles we lived by, and we had one boss. We didn't answer directly to the boss. We had several underbosses that we answered to. He was far, far in the distance, you know, but we know where the, the messages were coming from. So you think, so that's one of the things I wanted to touch up on. So New York had five bosses when Lucky kind of divided everybody up and everybody went through the five bosses and then they would come, kind of work together. Chicago was under one boss. What do you think was the difference and the benefit of having one versus having five? Um, one boss, one leader, let's say, it's not as confusing for sure. When you got five different families out there, like New York had, you run into problems. Everybody's got different things, different territories. In Chicago, with this one boss, you knew what he wanted. He had different made men around him. They were called made men. And these guys had territories. So if you work for one of these made men, you knew that he was getting the orders from the underboss of the head guy. At that time, it was uh, Paul Rico. Mm -hmm. He was the boss in Chicago from 1962 to 1972. They call him Paul the Waiter Rica. Re a Carter went into retirement. But as soon as Rica went back to jail, or died, I'm sorry, then Ocardo takes over temporarily. And then he puts somebody else to control things. And at that time, they used a guy by the name of Jack Cerrone. And then when Jack went to jail, I mean, he could go on and on. Then they used... Uh, Joey Ayupa, another boss, and Joey Ayupa goes all the way back to Al Capone. Isn't Joey also the one that ended up uh, putting the uh, hit on Spilatra because he was too concerned about what's taking place here in Chicago, here in uh, Vegas? Joey Ayupa was in penitentiary at the time for the for the Las Vegas skim. If he was out, Tony would have probably never got murdered. The guy that put the hit on Tony Spilatra and his brother Michael was named Joe Ferriola. We used to call him John the Gull. Why, but why do they say Joey Ayupa did? A lot of articles talk about the fact that Joey put the hit. Joey Ayupa was in jail. He was very close to Tony. Very close to Tony. And that's one of the reasons Tony became the guy he was, because of Joey Ayupa. The only thing I believe that Joey Ayupa was thinking about at that time 
was getting out of jail. I mean, he's an old man. Mm. They put him in jail. Got it. Got it. So he was a boss in jail. So, okay. So let's go back before we talk about some of the Vegas stuff. You know, when I read a lot of stuff on you is, Frank, I mean, it's, you've been a tough guy since you were a kid coming up. It's, it's what I hear about. So coming up in the streets of Chicago, who, who were you in the streets of Chicago? Like if I knew you at 12, 13, 14 years old, who was Frank? Just a tough guy that uh, didn't uh, take orders well from people, uh, that uh, had a sort of a, a complex about wearing thick glasses. At the time, I used to wear real thick glasses. So uh, I had a complex over it, and I fight in a, in a New York second, you know. And uh, a lot of people would say, uh, he's, a tough, he's a tough guy, don't mess with him, referring to me. I never heard that, but later on in years, I used to hear all them stories. So, and who were your parents? What did your mom do? My your father dad do? was uh, killed when I was eight years old in an automobile accident. He was being pursued by the police. My mother was a wonderful lady. She was a housewife, took care of us. She was uh, eight months pregnant with my brother at the time my father was killed in this automobile accident. And I had a sister, an older sister, five years older than me. Uh, my mother did the best she could do. She was left a little money, but you know, the money runs out, so you ha she never worked, so she had to find a job. And uh, she was good. She never wanted me to be the way I turned out to be. She never wanted you to oh, go that no. route. She would never take no money. Frank, was that in your environment at all, or no? W were, was the mob and the mafia around you at all, or no? Listen, uh, when I grew up, my father was a real tough guy. He, had, he was a legendary guy. Everybody knew about Joe Collada, that was his name. So I used to hear these stories about my father. He never wanted to be connected to the Chicago outfit, although he did things for him. He just never wanted to be connected because he didn't want anybody telling him how to live his life as I was. See, that's the things I learned. I, didn't, I sort of wanted to be like him. He was a driver, a wheelman, and a killer. And a killer. Oh, yeah. He was a killer. From these stories I heard, now, of course, he's not going to tell me this. His friends and relatives, not my, not my mother, relatives, mm. maybe distant cousins. So I idolized them. But he's what drove me to be the person I turned out to be. I hung in a neighborhood where I used to see all these old timers smoking cigars, had the fedoras on their head, trench coats, top coats, mm -hmm. nice cars, never working, beautiful woman around them. I thought maybe this was the kind of way I wanted to go, to be like them, but I don't want to be connected. I don't want to be a gangster. What age did you see that? At what age did you start seeing the fedora? You know, at 14. What, at 14. 15. And your, and your dad died when you were eight. Correct. And when you were eight, you had a, a brother that was coming. He said your sister's five years older than you? That's correct. And so let me ask you, what impact did it have when you heard the story? You're eight years old, you hear the story, mom, somebody tells you, dad just got into an accident, cops were chasing him. How, what kind of an impact, because this is a man you idolized. What did that do to you? It did hurt it, me to lose my father, of course. Sure, it, of course. It troubled me uh, deeply, it really bothered me. The impact it had was not as far as getting even with the police or anything like that, yeah. none of that. Uh, I admired him. My mother always told me, don't believe all the stories you hear, but I, I admired my father, and I, I, of course I believed them stories. So it had a big impact on my life. I thought about it years later, and it, I think it sent me in a direction I went. Did it produce any rage at all, or no? Was there anything like, you know, because of this, I'm going to want to be like my dad even more than I wanted before. Well, I did see a lot of rage in my father. I seen a lot of rage in my father. My mother was never struck by my father. He verbally screamed at her all the time because he was a very jealous man. My mother was a very attractive woman, very good woman. But my father was a very insecure man. And he screamed at her. He was particular about the furniture. I mean, and as a kid, this sticks in your head. Mm, wow. Your mind is developed when you're six. Yeah. 
And of course, I'm eight years old. So, but I never done the things he did as far as hollering at females as I got older. Because I think I learned from that. And some people go the opposite direction. Interesting. But I learned from that. But I still love my father. And uh, I never seen him stealing. I just heard stories about him stealing and killing people and stuff like that. And that was fashionable then for people to talk about stuff like that. And uh, that's that was probably set me on my way. Got it. So it was a source of, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, maybe inspiration, but also at the same time, a, a way of life. So you're 14 years old, you're seeing these fedoras, you're seeing this lifestyle. You're kind of a kid that you don't want people to push you around and tell you what to do. You build a little bit of a reputation. What was the first experience on how you started getting close to the family? The Chicago outfit? Yes. That family? Uh, well, of course, I knew they were around all the time, and you'd hear stories about them, and then you'd see these individuals, and you would start admiring them. And then my friend that I started hanging with at the time, we were shining shoes together. It's a known story. It's in one of my books. His name was Tony Splacho, and he was a tough street kid. He had five brothers, and uh, we got in a confrontation. You and Tony? Oh, yeah. And uh, shining shoes, different territory. And then we come to find out that his father and my father were good friends from the old neighborhood, let's say. And we became friends, Tony and I. It's something like you would see in a movie, but this is true. And uh, we realized that we were going to be friends the rest of our life, which we were. And we fought together. We stole together. We beat up people together. You fought together or you fought together? We fought other people. Other people, we got it. We never fought each other. Uh, there was was, no, his, was his father's reputation like your father? No, his father, his name was Patsy. His father was a hardworking man. He owned a restaurant and the neighbor, the old neighbor, Grand and Ogden. And he was famous for his meatball sandwiches. The reason being that my father and him, his father got along so well. My father used to go in there. Everybody liked Patsy. One day, Patsy told my father, he says, the black can, I don't know if you people are aware what the black can is. There are a bunch of grease balls that first came here many, many years ago before there was a syndicate and all of that. And they used to muscle their own kind, meaning all the immigrants from Italy, take money from them. So they were putting the muscle on Tony Splacho's father, Patsy. They go around and they take money from him. So one day he told Joe, he told my father, he said, hey, Joe, he said, but these grease balls are driving me crazy. He said, they come here once a week. If I ain't got the money, they're threatening me and this and that. So my father said, what day they come here? And he told him. My father says, I'll be here next Thursday or whatever day it was. So these couple of grease balls come in there. They couldn't speak English. You know, this is our, what I call grease balls. What they, year is this, like 40s, oh mid-40s? Yeah, that was, I don't, I wasn't even in existence then. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. So it's prior to your existence. Like, you're yeah. not born yet. I wasn't even born yet. So they went in there, and my father was in the back room with another couple of guys, and they start threatening Patsy Splacho. My father and the other guys come out of the back room and kill these guys. Took them and dumped them somewhere, I don't know, but killed them and dumped them. Two and, guys. Yeah, two guys. Okay. From there, it went a little further. Then they went and uh, got the leader, the head guy. And they caught him uh, in a motel room. He went on the run, him and his wife. And they caught him in a motel room with his wife. They didn't kill the wife. They killed him in bed. And that ended the black hand in Chicago. Mm. That ended it. Regardless of what you hear, this is a true story. That ended it. Then the Chicago outfit came about, all right, Capone and so on. And then it started coming about. And my father was a recognized individual, and he didn't want to be part of any kind of an organization. What was his reasoning for that? Because we were all Italians. What do you want to bother your own kind for? Hard work and people that are selling fruit and vegetable on the street, and you come from the same country these people come from, and you want to 
humiliate them and take their money? Do like they do. So he's got mad. He's def- protecting them. Got it. Interesting. So, so then you and Spalatra start doing things. You guys are fighting people. You're doing all this other stuff together. And he also had a reputation. said he had five brothers. And then uh, uh, you work. And, and, and when, did, when did the money-making uh, process start for you? When did you guys start making some real money? Well, we, st- we were making money, you know, doing, they call it the bank route. You know, well, this was later on. Well, what happened was Tony always used to tell me, he used to say, Frankie, one day I'm going to be a boss in the outfit. This was his words. And you hear this all the time from How different people. How old was he when he told you this? We were about 16 years old. Wow. And I tell him, I don't want to be involved with them people. You know, I want to do what I'm doing. Mm. I was robbing, whatever, mm-hmm. robbing with other guys. And he said, well, when I become a boss, I'm going to make you my right-hand man. I said, thank you, don't, but I don't want to be involved, Tony. And uh, he says, okay, okay, okay. And when we were 18 years old, in one of my books, Tony come and got me and he said, we got a big robbery. I want to include you in Anna and Richie, Richard Garman, Dickie Garman, they call him. He was the guy that I brought around. He was a, th- a thief. He says, we're going to go with three other guys. You don't know them. I said, I never rob with strangers. He said, that's all right. I know these guys. They're from Grant and Ogden, meaning the neighborhood I was born and raised in. <clears throat> so we went down there and we met the three individuals. One of the guys became our boss in later years. His name was Joe Lombardo. They call him Joey the Clown. Very, he's in jail now doing natural life. So uh, we went and we met these three individuals and then we drove all of us to Indiana. It was a bank. And I thought, well, we could rob a bank in Illinois. Why do we gotta go to Indiana? They said, we're gonna rob the safety deposit boxes in the bank, in the vault. So we cased it out. We cased it out for a couple of weeks. It was a very difficult robbery, very time consuming, because we had to go to the building next door, through the basement, through a double foundation, and into the bottom of the bank, and go through the floor of the bank and go into the vault. Just like you would see in movies, we've mm. done it then. With tools that weren't as modern as they are today. And we got in there. We didn't count the money as we were taking it out. We threw it in duffel bags. When we got back to uh, Chicago, of course there was two cars. I don't want to go through the whole thing. It'd take forever to tell you about it. We got to Chicago. We counted the money on the bed we, in this guy's place, one of the guys that was with us. It was on a full-size bed. The money was like a foot high. Covered the whole bed all the denominations and jewelry. I was 18 years old. I've never seen that much money in my life. It was 750,000 cash. And it was like, I didn't know, we didn't know the value of the jewelry. It was like a million in jewelry. And I thought, wow, I'm rich, I'm a millionaire. And we all thought that. Then the bad news came. That's when I really learned about the Chicago outfit. Joe Lombardo says, you know, I'm, I work for the bosses. I run crap games, dice games. He says, we got to kick in 20%. I says, I ain't giving nobody shit. Tony says, Frankie, we got to. He says, they'll kill us. We won't be able to spend the money. I says, I ain't giving them no money. Why should I give them no money? I said, we robbed the place. They don't know about it. He says, well, Joey's going to have to tell them. He says, you got, we got to give it to them. So I says, all right, if that's the way. One of the guys didn't want to give it up. I don't know whatever happened to him. I never seen him again after that. Really? I never seen him. I know that I got my 20%. I mean, I know that I got my money. The jewelry, we, we wind up keeping the money out of that. Now, you only know you. On jewelry, if it's worth a, a say, an estimated value of a million dollars, you're lucky you wind up with 25% that's of right, it. That's yeah. you know? right, So uh, I, just to get it is all right. So I wind up with like 50,000. I'm 18 years old, 50,000, $750,000 robbery. But still, that's a lot of money, In right? 1956, that's a that's lot of money. That's a lot of money, you know. Money, yeah. So I was, you know, happy to get it. And, and that's when I learned about what they should get. And then I learned again that I had to give 20%. I always knew it, but 
I mean, another big robbery, the first Brinks truck robbery in Chicago history, I done with five other guys, an armored car. And we wound up with 360 some thousand dollars. And then all of a sudden, we had to give another 20% to the outfit. And I told Pops, Peanuts Pam School, he was like one of our guys that put the score together. He said, we gotta give the, the guys in Cicero 20%. I said, my God, these guys are making money, they ain't doing shit. So I had to keep the money in my house until the two guys come and picked it up. They're 20% and they brought it to the boss. So that's the way it goes in Chicago, you know. Well, if you make a large score, you got to kick in 20%. What if, benefit do you get for that? What do you get in return for that? Protection? You get to or? do it actually what you want to do, you know what I mean? You just can't kill people, you know. If you got a score that's big, you go and ask them, hey, is this place connected? If it is, let me know and they'll tell you, no, go ahead and do it. Of course, by doing that, you're letting them know what you're doing. You know, the outfit, then you got to kick it in. But if it's a small robbery, you know, you know, you want to do, a, you want to be a bookmaker. And as I said previously, I think I told you, that's where the biggest source of income came in Chicago, was illegal gambling, not drugs. Illegal gambling. Who was the first that got into drugs, or no one ever got into drugs? Yeah, it's pretty strange, but I don't know if you've ever heard of. It. They call him Mad Sam Di Stefano. Uh, he was the juice man. He started out with 150000 on a loan from Paul Rica. He met him in jail, and he said, I'll make, well, you can borrow me 120000 and I'll make you a million a year, and he did. Mm. So when he set him up, when he gave him that money and set him up, they needed to have somebody with this Sam because he was nuts. The Sam, Mad Sam, was nuts. I mean, really a psychopath killer. So they put Tony Splotcher with him and Sam's brother, Mario. Sam was so bad, he killed his own brother. He did or he, he, he would? Did. His younger brother killed Sam his own. Sam killed his own brother? Yeah. For what reason? Drugs. He was stealing drugs. Sam got into the drug business. I'm not very in away from this. He wasn't a made man. He was making him over a million dollars a year for the outfit. So they protected their investment with him. Mm -hmm. Now, they knew that he got into the drug business, but they kept their distance. arm distance because they didn't want that. It's a terrible thing to be involved in in Illinois. But yet, they got the money. In other words, if he, the profit, he would give them profit, you know, so much. I don't know what it was. I can't honestly mm. tell you. And that's when I found out that they were dealing these drugs through Sam, only Sam at the time. And then after a while, the door opened a little bit, you know, a little bit more. But the bad, big bosses, it was more like bootlegging, going back to the bootlegging, all right? Because there's a lot of money in drugs, but still illegal gambling was more money. M more so, money in illegal gambling than drugs. Oh, man, back then, these guys are all multimillionaires from, from alcohol, the bootlegging days, you know. Let me ask you, Frank, what is the relationship at that time between the Chicago outfit and New York and I know there was some stuff in Milwaukee and Florida and some of this other stuff, but mainly Chicago and New York. How did you guys view each other? How did the families look at each other? We got along. Okay. That was their business. Chicago was our business. Uh, I don't believe that we ever need, I don't know if any time I needed anybody from New York to help us. Or I know Tony hung around with a couple guys from New York and they were pretty nice guys. What he done with them, I don't know. I know there was one guy that was sent from New York. He was a young guy. He was sent there because they killed his father. His father's name was Louis Ebley. The son's name, we call him Louis the Mooch. Mm -hmm. When they whacked his father, his father was a hitman in New York. The New York sent the, the son to Chicago with us because he was like wanting to get even for his father getting killed. So they send the son to, to Chicago. I never did like the guy as I was growing up. I can't stand him. He was one of the guys involved in Tony Splotcho's murder, too. In Vegas? You no, know, in Chicago. That's where they killed Tony. Wow. He was one of the guys involved in the murder. And Tony was his boss. Interesting. So did he end up getting even with anybody in New York or no? Who? Mooch. He never got it. No, no, no. Yeah, he had it. When he got to Chicago, he was stole. 
you could open up these jukeboxes and these pinball machines, pick a territory, you know, you got to kick it in. So the kid was making a lot of money for him. So, uh, Frank, was the, the families are still, you know, the money eventually is going back to Naples and it's going back to Sicily, right? It doesn't matter if it's Chicago or New York. I don't think Chicago money goes back to Sicily. Chicago money never went to Sicily? As far as I could tell you, no. Why not? What was the difference between Why? Chicago? They weren't running nothing over there. May have done it in New York, but they weren't running nothing in Chicago. So you guys didn't go to the voting every four or five years that you Say voted? What? Vote. When you would go and vote in the family... In Sicily, there was no one from Chicago was part of Not that. Not that I know of. Interesting. I can honestly tell you that. Not that I know of. Not that you know from Chicago. Okay. I mean, I would have heard. I think I would have heard. Yeah. Because I was connected to all the big guys. I should have heard. I never heard. If, if maybe it was that secret that I should know. Did Spalatra go to Sicily or I don't no. know, or Naples? No. No, never. not a lot, or no, you never heard him I go I know there. he never went. Oh, you never, he never I know went. the furthest place he ever went was like, Paris, the UK, it was for jewelry robberies. Jewel robberies. Right, got it. Interesting. So when does, uh, when does Spalatra become a boss? What age? I, he really got involved when he was 18. And I believe in the, I'm trying to think of the year when he became a made man. I think it was in 1970, in between 74 and 77. So I'm not quite sure. Mid 30s. Well, he was born in May and I was born in December. So we're not that much of a difference in age. So 38. Both of you born in 38. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So, so he becomes a made man. And at this point, what are you guys doing together? You're still running together? I was in and out of jail. I was in and out of jail. I got out of jail in 1974. I went in in 1968 for a robbery I didn't commit. True story. I got framed by the government. Don't say they can't. Anybody could frame you. They were just so mad at me because I was beating all these cases. They told me, we'll get you. They framed me, and I said, you frame me. That's the way it goes. Mm. I got 15 years. Then a lot of things happened. A couple other people rolled, became government informants. And with all of these cases, they start testifying me on about the brink struck mm -hmm. robbery, this, that. I wound up with 36 years. But they combined all the years the highest sentence, they run them concurrently, turned out to be 15 years on the bump case, the case that I didn't have a chance. So I did state and federal time. Uh, 15 or 6? On the 15, I did state time. I did four years. They paroled me Got it. to a federal detainer. Total time you've been in, how many years? Six have? years. Oh. Total time, 12 years. You did another six. Why well, not? Yeah, two years here, oh, a year there, you know. Anything for murder or no? Nothing was ever no. for murder. But you know, obviously, you've committed many. Uh, yes, I did. Yeah. Not you, many. I've, I've committed murder. Do you know the number? Like uh, uh, Two directly, two indirectly. Two directly, two indirectly. Does, does that at all go One's in your... a very famous one. One's a very famous one. They call it the m and &M murders. Is this the one with Jerry? No, it's the one with Billy McCarthy and Jimmy Moralia. Jerry, you're talking about Jerry Listener? I'm talking about Jerry Listener. Yeah, that's, that's a different one. That wasn't as famous as the m and m If you've seen the movie Casino, the guy's head in the vice, mm -hmm. that was the m and m murders. Don't make me be a bad guy. Come on. That's a pretty tough scene to watch. In real life, his head was jammed down in the vice. Face forward, down. It wasn't up. I didn't do that. But you were there. I, I, yeah, but let's say Tony done it. Interesting. So, so uh, here's, here's a question for you. Uh, I was in the military, okay? Yeah. And in the military, um, you know, you talk to special forces, you know, Delta, you talk to a lot of these guys. Eventually, it becomes part of your job where you don't necessarily look at it as, I did something and I killed this person. Right. How was it for you as a first time when it happened? Like, was it just kind of like, this is my job, this is what I'm supposed to do? Or was was there a part of it where you afterwards felt guilty, you thought about the family, the kids, people involved, or no, cold, here's what my job is, I'm doing it, I'm good to go? Well, I didn't look at it as a job. I looked at it as an order that I received. I knew there was, you don't get no paycheck for killing nobody. You know, like there was, you know, oh, you get money, no, you don't get a paycheck. You get stripes, though. Yeah, I guess you could call it stripes or a notch. I don't know. I never re thought of it that way myself. I thought of it was, if they come to you 
and they tell you, Frankie or Pete, I want you to kill uh, Pete over there or Harry, you don't ask why. They wouldn't come to you if they didn't think you would do it. If you say, no, I don't want to do it, you're going to die. Mm. So they come to you because they know you would do it for them. That's a, that's a very uh, common, when you ask uh, people who have killed, uh, whether it's military or you ask uh, gangsters, you know, like former, being in the military. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very much where I don't feel guilty because it's an order. I don't really do it. Somebody told me to do it. But I try to tell people and people start, oh, like the military, how could you disgrace our military? I'm not disgracing our military. But that's the way you would take it as an order from up above, a lieutenant or a sergeant. So let me ask you, did it ever like, uh, uh, did, did it ever haunt you at all with the decisions on what you did? Did it ever like middle of the night, you're like, shit, I, I really did no, this tonight? No, it bothered me. I didn't, I mean, it's not something you relish in doing. But after <clears throat> I rolled and seen the light, let's say, of course it bothered me. Interesting. And I... Uh, I think about it. I think about the faces all the time. Do you really? Yeah. Till today? Oh, yeah. I could picture their faces like right now looking at you. How do you process it? Like, how, how does it happen when you're sleeping? It's done. It... It's over with. There's nothing I could do. I can't, you can't bring them back once it's done. Am I sorry for my sins? You bet I am. You bet I am. Mm. Interesting. So, so let me ask you. So at this point, you're in Chicago. You're doing what you're doing. At what point... Did you make your way out to Vegas? Uh, I had several businesses going at the time in Chicago. So around in, uh, in 1978 or the early part of 1979, uh, I had a disco and I just got rid of it. And uh, Joe Lombardo, I remember I mentioned his mm -hmm. name earlier. Yep. We call him Joe. You didn't call him Joey the Clown to his face, you'd get killed. So Joey comes into my uh, place and he shakes my hand, he said, congratulations. And I thought he was congratulating me because we so I sold a giant. And I said, yeah, I said, nah, I got another step I got to do in life. He said, what are you talking about? You're moving to Vegas next week. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, well, I guess I'm moving to Vegas. The reason why I knew what he was talking about, because prior to that, Tony had asked me, Tony Splacho, mm -hmm. four or five times to move to Vegas with him to be his backup guy. And was he already in Vegas or he no? He was in Vegas since 1972. Oh, so way before you, like yeah. seven years before. Don't forget I was in jail. I didn't get out till that's 74. Right. six years, yeah, that's right. Got it. So I said, all right, I guess I'm moving to Vegas, but I can't do it in a week, Joe. He says, do it in the fastest amount of time you can. So like in a couple of weeks, three weeks, I did move to Vegas. And uh, that's when I knew that what my functions were going to be in Vegas. Did I know there was a skim going on? Yeah. Did I know how it was going on at that time? No, I didn't want to know, but I did find out. Of course I didn't want to know. That's one more person that knows. That's one more person that can mm. die. So what I knew what I had to do, I had to protect the hotels that the Chicago out, outfit controlled. There were four hotels. Mm -hmm. It was the Stardust, the Fremont, the Hacienda, and the Marina. Four properties that we control, you know, in other words, they had a guy, they put him in there, his name was Alan Glick. He was one of these rich real estate developers or whatever he was. I didn't know the guy personally, I just knew who he was. And Lefty was in there, uh, he thought he was going to be in there to manage the gambling part of it, but being that he had a record, he couldn't do that. So they made him in charge of entertainment, but he still was over at the oversee the skimp, all right? Lefty was. Lefty. He never watched them take it out. He didn't know. Huh. He just received the money. As I say on my tour, he received the money once a week, and then he would drop it off. And if you've seen the movie Casino, mm -hmm. that's the direction it went. Got it. In what, what ways did you make money here? Pardon me? What ways did you make money here? Obviously, there's a lot of different what opportunities. What ways did I make money? Yeah. There were several ways. When I came out, Tony told me that what my functions were going to be, to make sure nobody cheated in these hotels, uh, to shake down bookmakers, guys that were doing illegal bookmaking, get them for 20% or more. And I said, well, these guys are connected. The guys in different cities, don't worry about it. 
He says, just do it. He says, and you'll see what happens. So I send my guys out. Well, before that, I told him, Tony, these guys got to earn a living. If we muscle these bookmakers, you're getting the money. They ain't going to do it for nothing. Mm. He said, tell them they could steal out or they could do whatever they want in Vegas. They could what? Steal, rob. From you, from them. From homes, Anybody. businesses. Oh, oh, I see. Which got was it. a no-no at the time. I says, you sure you got the okay from Chicago? Because of what's going on on there, you know, with us and the money in the mm -hmm. casino. He says, it's all taken care of. Your guys could do what they want to do. I says, okay. So I told my guys, and man, it was like opening up a can of worms. So we got that name, the Hole in Wall Gang. Yeah. So I did my little thing, catching cheaters in hotels, muscle and bookmakers, sending that money back to Tony. But what I found out in doing that, the first guy was from Boston. I went and put the muscle on him. I sent Larry Newman. He worked for me. Mm -hmm. He was a killing machine, this guy. He also came here from Chicago? Yes. I met him in prison. He was doing 125 years for a triple murder. He only did 11 years. Where is he originally from? Some suburb in Chicago. His well, father, in Chicago. Yeah. Okay, got it. He was a crazy guy. Crazy. Crazier than Sam Madman or whatever? A, a sicker. I should sick, say sicker. sicker. Than oh, him. Yeah. oh, yeah. He was a sick man. Hmm. He would kill anybody. He would do things to people that are disgusting. I, I mean, if you shoot, kill somebody, shoot them. He would he'd chop them up and everything. He was a sick man. So anyway, I told Tony this, and Tony said, tell your guys they could do this, they could do that, and all this. And I said, he said, uh, he says, uh, then he told me, he said, all right, back off of this guy from Boston. I said, why, is he paying up? He said, yeah. He said, I talked to his bosses in Boston, mm -hmm. and they told me, all right, Tony, look out for my guy, and we'll cut you in on my reaction. So you see what you mm -hmm. see the game he was playing? He tell him, I'll protect your guy. They tell Tony, from other cities, New York, everywhere. Interesting. We'll take care of you, Tony. Make sure that nobody muscles our bookmaker. And that's what happened. So we used to go out and do this for him, which opened up the door for my gang, you know, my crew. What's the biggest uh, hit you guys had here? The biggest what? Biggest hit, biggest uh, uh, jewelry. I know you guys had a lot of different things. Yeah, I know. a lot of different things. You know, a couple hundred thousand in jewelry, uh, maybe 80,000 in cash. You know, but it was plentiful. In other words, at that time, nobody, people didn't report to the government their tips, and they keep the stuff in the house. I mean, I opened up a restaurant in three days out there. And that's all we did was burglarize three houses. Here? Yeah, it was all cash. And you had a restaurant? Opened it up with the cash. Did you do anything with Gianni Russo at all or no? I knew Gianni Russo. He yeah. was in the movie The Godfather. He was in the movie The Godfather. Yeah, Gianni Russo is a good guy. I told Gianni Russo one thing. I said, Gianni, you know what you are? You're the guys that portray me. I'm the real thing. He's, I know, I know. He's a good guy, Gianni. I was playing with him. What you know? year was that? How long ago was that? 78, 79. Uh, Gianni was uh, connected to Costello, though. Gianni, uh, years whatever, ago, he had a relationship whatever. with Frank. He probably had a relationship with yeah. him. But he knew us guys. Yeah. I knew Gianni. And he had a nightclub here, I think, for like a Yeah, I was in jail when he had it. He killed somebody there. Yeah, yeah. I lived at the Marie Antoinette when I first mm -hmm. moved out there. And he used to date a woman in that building, Deanne Warwick. Mm -hmm. You see? So I see him every day, and so I'd see her. Why'd you live there? Was it intentional? Were you I bought two like... condos in there. Oh, okay. So when I was... first moved out there. Got it. Then I was told I can't live there no more by the Homeowners Association because <laughs> of who I am. The cops were coming there. Constantly. Cops. Yeah. They'd raid my place all the time. Interesting. Interesting. So let me ask you. I mean, obviously, uh, this thing's going. You're doing what you're doing. At what point did things turn for you? At what point did things turn with you and uh, Tony? Because uh, I know FBI got involved. They started kind of watching what you guys were doing. That never bothered me with the FBI being involved. As a matter of fact, I know it was like a security blanket. You know, who's going to hit us? Who's going to kill us with these cops watching us all day long? Uh, what bothered me is Tony was never contributing to... Uh, 
our cases, like financially. It wasn't Tony's attorney, Oscar Goodman, that ended up being your attorney as well? He represented you, right? Yeah. He was a, he was a, a co-attorney. He and was a co-attorney. Yeah, John Mama was my attorney. He was an advisor. Got it. That's all he did. How was your relationship with Oscar? It was good at the time. But uh, Oscar got mad at me after I rolled. And that's his business. But I made a statement. He used to wear a Rolex watch. And it was a, it was a knockoff. It was a phony. So one day when I was going to court, I didn't have a tie. So Tony said, you got to have it. Oscar said, where's your tie? I don't wear ties. I wear sport jackets, you know. So Tony took his tie off. I said, I don't make knots. So Oscar says, I'll make it for you. So Oscar made the knot. And as he's making a knot, I'm looking at his watch. I said, you got a phony Rolex on. He's because I don't want guys like you to rob me. So I said that, and it went all over the air, you know, after I rolled. So it embarrassed them. So then he says, the guy don't even know how to make a knot on his tie. Who cares? And what is this in the 70s? Is this 70s, 80s? It same was era? in the 70s. It was in the 70s. Well, it's yeah. 80s, the early 80s. Have you guys reconnected at all since then? Oscar? I'm, not at all. There's yeah. no need to. There's no need to. He Got stays it. away from me. When we were doing the movie, he was on the set. He used to see me. He didn't come near me. Who would ask you? The questions on the movie, who was asking you questions? I worked right with Martin Scorsese. Oh, you worked directly with, with... I sat in the chair right next to him. So they were asking, what questions were they asking you? How was How'd Tony? How did that go? This? Did he use that type of gun? Is this the way you shoot somebody? That's specific. Is this the way you break a hole in the wall? Whatever we did, you know, in real life, he asked me. So anything you've seen in that movie was directions for me. Marty sat right next to me. And, and how was Pesci asking you questions? What Frank Pesci asking, did too, and so did De Niro. De Niro as well. Yeah. Got it. And they were asking you what? Frank were, Vincent. Just how this guy acted, their language. Like one particular scene, they called it Vig. So I told Marty, what are you saying, Vig? I said, we call it juice. You know, money. Mm -hmm. You know, you collect interest, mm -hmm. it's juice. And then they were saying something about, uh, they call him, I call it merchandise, stole it, swag. He says something about swag in the movie. I said, what's swag? He says, stolen stuff, <clears throat> stolen property. I said, we call it merch, short for merchandise. Right. So I changed a lot of scenes. The language, another scene, Frank Vincent said, you jerk off, he said to somebody. I said, oh, Marty, we never use that term. We say jag off, just like it said, jag off. So Frank Vincent had a change of scenery on. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's the truth. How yeah. was Pesci, by the way? How was Pesci with Pesci with was it? all right. I got along with Pesci. Yeah? Did anybody on the set you, you didn't get along with? Or I got everybody? along with everybody. Okay, yeah. So, so it was a good experience for you. Well, I never was going to become a director or anything, you know. Sure. I, I, I thought maybe one day it would do a movie. <coughs> never became that. And I was very close with Nick Pledgey. Very close to him. He's a good friend of mine, Nick. So, you know, when you look at the history of it, you got Frank Costello, Lucky Luciano, you got Ma uh, Meyer Lansky, and you got uh, Bugsy. And I know you and I were talking uh, briefly about Meyer Lansky. Who was, how was Meyer Lansky viewed in this whole thing? You know, you watch Bugsy and you kind of yeah. see who he was, or you watch the movie Mobsters with him and he's playing this role and Meyer low key, but he made a few hundred million dollars. How did you guys view Meyer Lansky? How do we view him as uh, from Chicago? Because he wasn't a well, Chicago. I viewed him as a, uh, as a Jew that, as a Jew, that had a lot of connections and he made a lot of money for the Chicago outfit, and the New York and uh, the Chicago outfit. Oh well, that's the way I viewed it. Got that's it. the way I thought about it. Whether he did or he didn't, I didn't know, but that's the way I thought about him, and uh, I, I gave this this guy a lot of respect over that, you know. So there was a lot of respect in the oh, form. Yeah. Was he a feared guy or was he a respected guy? Was he a feared guy? Feared? I never Was he feared or was he respected? I, I respected him. God. Frank, who were the ones that were feared? Names that were feared? Because it's a big difference. The names that were feared? Names that were feared. Names where you say, you know, this person was feared. Like you take Sammy, you know, you, you talk about the, uh, the madman, he was feared. You talk about Sam DeStefano. maybe Larry Newman was a little bit off and he was, uh, he was a bit feared. Who else was the feared uh, personality? Man, there was a lot of guys. Angelo LaPetri, uh, 
Chucky Nicoletti, uh, what's his name? I got that. There's so many names, I, I, I'm losing their names. Was Giancana Field or Giancana. Yeah, you didn't fear a guy like Tony Accardo because you know he would give the direction. Uh, Joey Ayupa would give the directions. Uh, Rika would give the directions on hits and stuff like that. There's this guy, Frankie Calabrese, that came along. Mm, Frankie Calabrese, yeah. I yeah. knew Frankie Calabrese when he was nobody. Nobody, believe me when I tell you. Uh, and he I, was feared. I, uh, Frankie come to me and wanted to get in the alpha. Mm. He wanted <laughs> He wanted me to, excuse me, <clears throat> he wanted me to hook him up with the outfit. And I told Tony, and Tony says, ah, we didn't want nothing to do with the guy. Frankie was a machine. He worked for a union then. And then Frankie became a, uh, a feared hit man. And there was uh, Harry Aleman. There was Butchie Petroselli. There was uh, James Tortorello. I could go on and on. It's a list of hitmen. But there's a reputation of these guys that were feared. They were, maybe they were not the biggest earners, but they were feared in the streets. There was, some of them were very big earners. Earners That's because, and feared. Yeah, and hitters. Got it. So you're falling out with Tony. I mean, when you read about it, you guys are best friends for a long time. You guys have been friends since you were in Chicago running the streets and you were doing the you know, shoe shining, all this old. stuff. Since 12 years old. So... When you read about it, you see the story when the FBI came and you guys were kind of going through it and you're not saying anything. You're not talking to the FBI agents. You're not saying anything to them. And you heard the recording. You know, what was it on the recording you heard that kind of threw you off? And what when threw you said, me off? Yeah. I was, uh, I got locked up. And I'll, the first day I got locked up, I was in the county jail out there, Clark, Clark County Jail. And I received a visit from an agent. And he said, uh, we got information that there's a, a contract that on your life. And I told him to get the f fuck out of the room. I knew the games they play. So when he got to the door, he says, if we could show you positive proof that there's a contract that on your life, would you cooperate? I says, I can't tell you that. So I walked out of the room, the, this conference room, and I they brought me down to, I was, I was in a dormitory, and they brought me to a cell. I said, why are you putting me in a cell? And he said, because there's a contract out on you. This is the Clark County Jailer. So I went in, just before I went in the cell, they called me back out, and they said they want to see you back upstairs again. I said, I don't want to go up. They said, you got to. So I went up, and when I went up, there was a couple agents there. I don't remember their names. They had these reel-to-reel -reel recordings and the earphones, and they had transcripts. And he told me, if you don't mind, listen to it and tell me who you, who's, talk, who's talking at him. So I listened, then he interrupted me. He said, who is the voices? I said, I can't tell you right now. I want to see. I want to hear the whole thing. That's when I heard the voices. And it was uh, two familiar voices. And the one guy said, what's going on out there? He called him T, short for Tony. He says, it's not me. It's the other guy. At, and I'm listening to the other guy. He's got to be referring to me, I'm thinking. He's like a loose cannon. He's in the can right now. They locked him up. I can't control him. He should be making the bond pretty soon. He says, he's the one that's doing all of that? And he says, yes. He says, then clean your dirty laundry. Hmm. Now, I didn't fall out of a tree. I've heard that term used too many times. So I put the earphones down, and I said, I want to go back to the cell. He says, do you know the voices? I said, yeah, I know the voices. You want to tell me it's not at this time? Are you ready to cooperate? I said, not at this time. I need to think about it. Locked me in my cell. I contemplated several things to do with myself physically. Then I says, if I do that, he won. Meaning, Meaning what, like suicide? Huh? Suicide. I've, absolutely. Because I never was brought up that way to roll, to be uh, not an informant. There's yeah. a big difference between being an informant and a witness. I never was brought up that way to testify. And roll, when you use that word, that's like snitching. Is the same yeah, thing? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay, got it. Got I it. wasn't raised this way. 
So I says, nah, I can't do that. I says, first of all, I don't have the guts to kill myself. Second of all, if I did it, Tony winds up a winner. Spleen and Splatcho. So I, uh, I waited till the morning. In the morning, I asked the guard, could I make a phone call? He said, what do you need? I said, I need to talk to them agents that were here. He says, we'll get right back to you. Within 30 seconds, the door opened. I said, Jesus Christ. I thought maybe the agents were sleeping in the room upstairs. Wow. That's how fast they were there. And I, I told them, you know, I'll cooperate. They instantly moved me out of that jail, put me in a motel. I had armored guards everywhere you could possibly think mm. of. And then uh, they, uh, he started interviewing me, the one guy. And he wanted me to talk about murders, and I didn't want to. They want you to talk about murders first to show how sincere you are about being a witness, you know. And I said, I, this is something I've never done before. I said, this is a hard thing for you. You're asking me to do it. I said, I can't do it right now. So I talked about other crimes. Then at the very end, he says, you got to talk about murders. He says, then you'll get your immunity. I said, but he says, we didn't read you your rights. If we read you your rights and you talked about murders, then we got we could hold you to it. But as long as we didn't read you your rights, we can't hold you to it. That's something new. I never knew that. Mm. So I had to take a chance. What was I going to do? So I took a chance. As soon as I said that, he got up and walked out of the room. He said, another guy will be talking to you. I said, I walked into a fucking trap. That's the first thing out of my mind. Because I can't trust these guys. All my life they're chasing me around, yep. trying to kill me, put me in jail. All of a sudden I said about murder. Another guy come in the room, talk to me, and I was with friends with this guy till this day, the agent. Dennis Arnley, his name is. You were friends with him till this till day? Till this day. Really? How do conversations know his wife and kids, to him? everything. How do you talk when you talk to them? What are the conversations We're like? We're friends. We talk huh. about everyday affairs. We're friends. Interesting. I build up a trust in me and a trust in him. Get out of here. I'm serious. You, the FBI agent. He's retired. Wow. Several of them. And several Metro cops. Interesting. They're not friends with yeah. To this day, the guy, same guys that used to chase me around trying to kill me. Hmm. We looked at it in a different, it was a ball game. We played, it was a ball game. They just had more people in their gang than us. Yeah, that makes sense. Frank, what did it do to you with your uh, uh, a relationship with Tony? Like, how did you view this friendship now of nearly 30 something years, 40 something years? It destroyed years? me. Yeah. It destroyed me that a friend would do this to me, my best friend. Mm. I love this guy like my brother. For him, to put cast all the weight on me, it was devastating. You know, I never thought he'd do that, but he had to take the heat off of him because he was doing wrong. You see, he got paid back in the end, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's the main scene. I could go back to Chicago tomorrow and live there. You could go back to you Chicago. You bet you I could. No one would do anything to you. You bet I could. Really? Yeah. They knew. They knew back there. They knew. A lot of guys back there said, why would Frankie roll? There has to be a reason would cause him to do this. He would never do that, and I would never do that. Once he got the head, was there validation where your credibility went up? My credibility with who? With Chicago Outfit, like because they're not I fully... I would never go back there and try to be a gangster. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is... So you're doing what you're doing. You go and you roll. My and then, credibility as far as what I've done. Yeah, meaning. So who's really uh, the one? So maybe it was Tony. Maybe it was you. How did Chicago view you and Tony? First of all, they didn't approve of me rolling, which they never would. Of course they would. Yeah. They never would approve of it, and I don't blame them. Sure. They wouldn't kill me if I went back there. Yeah. They know I had to do what I'd done. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not going to sit down and have pasta and share pasta together. I don't have no fear of my life, absolutely none, of going back there. At one time I did, had fear. At what point did that fear go away? It took 23 or 25 years. 
Oh, so the fears are recent, like two decades that has gone away, a decade that's uh, gone When I went in, it was, I've been 34 years. Got it. So 25 years. Got it. When I first put my first book out, that's when I opened up the door. What, the day Tony died, what was your immediate reaction? What, who called you? Like, how, what happened to you when that I, happened? Uh, I was called prior to him being found. So you body. knew this was going to take place? I heard it on the news. I was in the witness protection program in Mobile, Alabama. Oh, no, but did you know that this event was coming or no? You heard it the day, day it happened. I heard, I, got a, I, got, I heard it on TV that the Splatro brothers were missing. I said, wow. I said, well, they're dead. I thought to myself. Then I get a call from the marshal service, and the mm-hmm. marshal service says to me, uh, the FBI want to speak to you. So I go talk to the FBI. They come over and talk on They didn't come over. We talked on the phone. That same guy, Arnoldy. Friend. Yeah, yeah, agent. He says, Tony and Michael didn't show up for court. Do you know where they would have ran off to? I said, they didn't run anywhere. He said, how do you know that? I said, because I know Tony. I says, if I, if I was a guest of mine, I'd tell you they're dead right now. How do you know that? It's because I know Tony ain't going to run. I says, I know it. Tony knows that you're going to get caught sooner or later. I've been around this guy all my life, Dennis. I know he's not going to run. He says, really? I said, yeah, you'll see. Four days later, the body showed up in the cornfield. Mm-hmm. He said, where do you think they were killed afterwards? I said, they weren't killed in no cornfield. He said, where? I said, probably in a basement, some house. Where? I said, either in Cicero, Illinois, or, or uh, Bensonville. Why do you say that? Because we got people that live in them towns, and you could do stuff in their houses. That was it. Interesting. Years later, with Sammy the Bull, when that happened with Sammy, how did you view Sammy? I figured the guy had to do what he had to do. I figured Gotti, Gotti, Gotti threw him to the wolves. Similar story? Yeah, similar story. Yeah. I never disrespected Sammy. I always felt as though Sammy was a man like me. I consider myself a man and Sammy a man. Uh, did you guys ever speak or no? Huh? Did you have ever speak or no? You and no, Sammy? No, okay, I, I don't. Got it. You know. Sammy's got his own private life. I know he did 20 years, the yeah. poor guy. You know, but that's, how do you get involved in drugs? You know, I don't know what the story is there. But. Final thoughts before we go into uh, uh, the books here. Uh, what, what is the, you know, conclusion you got from living that life? Obviously, it's a whole different story today where a lot of that doesn't exist. Uh, when you said you had a moment two years after you were, you know, you, you rolled, what happened to him where you're like, you know what, this is not a life I want to live. I want to live a changed life. What were, what were those events? What was that process like? Well, you're, you know, you're around legitimate people, and you see how they live. And, you know, even legitimate people have a bad side to them, you know. And uh, I s- start going to church and stuff like that. I always, I was raised a Catholic. I went to Catholic school as a young young man, so I went back to the religion, and then I stopped going to church, and I just know that there is a God and a Jesus, you know, and uh, I do my praying, that's all. Hopefully, he's, he's accepted me, hopefully. Interesting, very interesting. Well, uh, uh, you know, your story's a, a, a very, very interesting story, and there's a lot of different lessons in there you know, I'm always curious, different about the Chicago versus New York and what cultures they have on the leadership style. But uh, here's what I would say if you're watching this, obviously you've seen uh, on Value Tim, we've done a lot of different mob uh, interviews, whether it's Michael Francis, Gianni Russo, Oscar Goodman. I mean, I can go on with a lot of different lists that we have, and there's a lot of exposure that we accidentally got into this market. If you'd like to know more about his story, he wrote a book called The Rise and Fall of a Casino Mobster. We'll put the link below here. But if you ever pay a visit to uh, Vegas, you do personal tours, apparently. Maybe tell I us have, a little about this personal tour. So I what do is, personal tours, yeah. I put people in my personal vehicle, or I take them in a rented vehicle, and I bring them to all the locations in Las Vegas that we shot the movie Casino, the movie, and 
places where people were murdered, robberies, and uh, it's personal. I'm in the car with my people. You tell the story about what I happened here, story, what happened everything. there. Interesting. And uh, if they ever go to TripAdvisor and stuff like that, they could. My phone number, you know. Yeah, we're going to put the link to TripAdvisor. And by the way, even the Mob Museum, do you take them through to the Mob Museum? Because I know your picture's on the wall at the Mob Museum yes. as well. Do they go through that tour with you or no? Do you go there? I don't. I, don't, I do speaking engagements. Yeah. They call me quite often. Okay, got and it. And I do speaking engagements there. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the link below. We're also going to put his phone number below uh, uh, to find out about the tours. And uh, if you, again, want to find out more, Go order his book. The link will be below for the book. Frank, thank you so much for coming. I really Pleasure. enjoyed talking to you. Okay. Truly.